online. And basically, there's a program federally going on called Science Odyssey, which is taking place between the 12th and 21st of May, essentially to give people across the country an opportunity to learn about the wonderful science, the wonderful science happening in Canada being carried up by Canadians. And we are very fortunate tonight to have Dr. John Jameson visiting us from the Department of Sciences at Memorial University. And John, I don't know if anyone here has checked his link on the website, but his work focuses on hydrothermal systems, such as we see on the video here, also known as black smokers, which exist on the seafloor, and uh, the formation of volcanogenic massive sulfide deposits. So basically looking at volcanic activity on the seafloor, so those in a very, very simple nutshell. There's a lot more information, we won't go into that. What he wants to talk about here tonight is how scientists map and explore the ocean floor, and he's going to look at some of the geological features and biological features that we find on the ocean floors today. So with that, I'll hand it over to John. Thank you, Rob. Um, thanks for the invitation to come and, and speak, and thank you all for uh, coming to listen. Uh, how this talk is going to proceed is I'll, I'll give a, a brief information uh, description of my background and how I got to uh, where I am here. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, how we map planets, including Earth, and then I'm going to get into how we map oceans, and then some of the reasons why we are mapping oceans, and some of the challenges um, going into the future. And at the end, um, you will understand everything that is happening on the screen right now. Um, but we'll get there. So I'm going to explain a little bit about myself using uh, a map. Um, I am originally from Edmonton, Alberta. And I grew up in the 80s when the Edmonton Oilers won the Cup almost every year. And uh, so I do not want to talk about the playoffs this year anymore. <laughs> uh, I did my Bachelor of Science degree at the University of Alberta, which is in Edmonton. And then I moved to the United States and I did a master's degree at the University of Maryland. Um, and then after that, I did my PhD back in Canada at the University of Ottawa. And uh, when I finished my PhD, um, I actually went over to Europe, to Germany for a few years. And I worked at a place called GeoMar, which is an oceanographic research institute. And I was there until came over to the University, uh, Memorial University, uh, right here. So I, I jumped around a little bit, and in that time I also um, was a, uh, a, a geologist, a traditional geologist. Uh, between degrees I, I worked mostly in, in Canada. Um, I worked for a while doing gold exploration in, uh, in the Benefit in the Canadian Arctic. Um, that's uh, a camp I worked at for several summers. That's now an actual mine. Um, this is about uh, 15 years ago. I've worked in uh, central British Columbia. I've been mapped, uh, mapped in northern Alberta, uh, diamond exploration in central Alberta. I did some underground mine work in northern Ontario and some open pit mining related work in northern Quebec. So I, I moved around uh, quite a bit um, as a, a, a traditional uh, geologist. And then through my PhD and, and the research I've been doing since then, I've moved from sort of land-based geology to marine geology, studying the oceans and the ocean floor. And then since that time, my work has taken me all over the world. Wow. Um, looking at um, these black smokers like you saw in that uh, original video on the first slide. Um, and so I, I have a lot of uh, air miles as a result of, uh, of this work. So this background map that I've been showing you here is, is a little bit different probably from a map you're used to looking at because land is just black and you see all these features on the ocean floor. So what I'm going to talk about is, is what are these maps, how do we get this information, and then how do we use this information. Um, this is what we're used to seeing. This is NASA's uh, blue marble map. So this is a, a composite image taken from satellites. So some might argue this isn't a map, this is just a photograph almost of the planet. 
And you can see there's a whole bunch of features. You can see on land, forests, and deserts, and ice, and of course, most of the ones covered in snow. Um, but the oceans, these satellites uh, take these images, you can't see through water. So all we see is a blue ocean surface. We don't see any features. There's very little information here. So this is imagery, satellite imagery. This is what we call a digital elevation model. It's topography. It's mountains and hills and valleys on land, and the colors represent different elevations. Sort of purple for low lying, and get into the greens, and then you see places like the Andes and the Himalaya mountain ranges. And um, so this isn't a picture. This is a, a digital representation of the land surface. But again, here, you see the oceans, there's just one color, there's no information here at all. Now to, to understand the challenges of global mapping, um, we're actually going to go somewhere else. Who knows what this is? What is it? Close, very close. Second guess. Farther away than the moon. This is where people want to go one day. Matt Damon was here in the movie. <laughs> Mars, yes. Um, so this is Mars. Okay, so why are we talking about Mars? Mars has been mapped using the Mars Global Surveyor. Uh, this was launched in 1996, and on it, there is a Mars Orbiter Laser Altimeter. Now what this does is this measures the surface topography of Mars. And so we have a digital elevation map of Mars, which looks like this. So again, here is the Martian surface, and it's colored based on um, elevation. And we have here horizontal resolution of 60 meters to 2 kilometers. What this means is that the amount of information we have is spaced at the, at the best every 60 meters. So every 60 meters we have a data point. That means that we can't see objects that are smaller than 60 meters on the Martian surface using this information. Now the Mars Global Surveyor also has a camera on it. And this camera has a resolution of 240 meters per pixel. So same idea, we have Photographs. This image here is made up of thousands and thousands of photographs that have been stitched together. And the resolution of all of this is every single pixel, every color dot on this image on the surface is about, represents 240 meters. So again, taking photographs, we can't see anything smaller than probably actually two or three times this number. So anything smaller than about a kilometer we can actually see using these photographs from this camera. Now, so there's an example of one of these images from the camera. All right, here's, here's, here's your chance. What's that? Moon. Moon, <laughs> yes, it is the moon. This is our, our closest neighbor, and the moon has also been mapped um, with a lunar reconnaissance orbiter. And again, we can go through the same exercise. There's a laser altimeter that gives us um, an elevation model of the moon. So we know what the topography of the moon is. And we've also photographed the entire surface of the moon at a resolution of 100 meters per pixel for the entire um, lunar surface. Okay, and there's an example. Okay, now Earth. Earth is actually much harder, much harder to do than Mars or the Moon. Um, two reasons, it has a thicker atmosphere and there's clouds and that complicates the measurements from space. More significant than that is the fact that you have multiple surfaces. We have a land surface, which is very similar to Mars or the Moon, but we have the oceans. Now there's an ocean surface, there's also the ocean floor actually two surfaces that we can deal with here. So how do we do that? Well, we have our own satellites, again, several actually, but one of the more recent ones 
is the uh, Aster. This is the uh, Terra satellite. Aster is a, a basically a very high-tech fancy camera developed by the Japanese. And with that, we can map the surface, the hard surface, the land surface, at a horizontal resolution of 30 meters. So actually much better than what we got for Mars or for the moon. So that's what this data set was. So this is the whole topography of the surface. This is what it looks like in digital format. We also take pictures. When you think of uh, Google Earth satellite images, um, these come from satellites like WorldView, resolution of 0.3 meters, 30 centimeters. So every little pixel in these images is a little piece of land about 30 centimeters. So you can see a lot doing that. Here's what that global data set looks like. And lots of detail on the land surfaces. You can actually see some features in the oceans. You can see um, shallow areas, uh, plankton blooms maybe. So you're starting to see a little bit of information from these space photographs. Okay, now what about the seafloor? Well, this is where things get interesting. If you take a look at the planet, actually, most of it is covered in water. In fact, 70% of our surface is water, and only 30% is actual land. So this is the challenge that we face. How do we overcome that challenge? The seafloor, we talk about bathymetry as opposed to topography. It's basically the same thing. It's hills and valleys on the seafloor. We use a technique called satellite gravity. Now this is really neat. It was developed mostly by um, two gentlemen in the United States, Dr. Samuel and Smith. What happens is, here we have the seafloor, and if we have a mountain on the seafloor, that's a lot of rock. That's a lot of material piled up in one place. And as a result of that, Earth's gravity is actually slightly higher where you have big mountains. So if you have more gravity there, which happens to the water in the ocean, it'll preferentially flow and pile up on top of a mountain on the seafloor simply because there's more gravity pulling things in that direction. It's a very subtle effect, a giant underwater volcano, you might only see a two or three meter higher sea surface. Um, so you can't see it with your naked eye. But satellites can actually measure this. And so it turns out that the sea surface, which we normally think of as being flat, you know, once you get rid of tides and waves and things like that, actually the sea surface will mimic the topography of the seafloor. And with satellite measurements of this sea surface elevation, we can actually produce what we call a model of what the seafloor actually looks like. And this is exactly that image that we had up before, what that represents. So all of these features you see, and you can see there's underwater mountain ranges, you can see these little chains of islands, that's an oceanic trench where it's really deep. Um, we have the entire sea floor mapped like this. However, if you look at the resolution, it is one to four kilometers. So it's not a very accurate map. We don't have a huge amount of information. But we have enough information from um, these data that we can see a lot of very interesting features on the sea floor. Okay. What about imagery of the sea floor? We have images of all of Mars, all of the moon. We have Google Earth satellite images of the entire surface of the planet. What about the seafloor? No, nothing. There's a few places where people have gone down and, and taken photographs with, with, with submersibles or robotic vehicles. That covers 0.0000% very, very little of the seafloor. So we don't actually know what the seafloor looks like. And we haven't even come close to understanding this at a global scale. So again, here's a challenge we face simply because satellites, we can't see through water. OK, 
Okay, so I'm just going to quickly summarize these numbers here. Again, we have Mars, we have the Moon, we have Earth, land, and water. We look at the resolutions, we compare on land, 30 meter resolution topography compared to uh, the Moon and to Mars. We're doing pretty good. Um, imagery, we're doing very good here. Um, also, it should be noted that this is publicly available imagery. Governments probably have much better imagery than what we're looking at us right now through the ceiling. Um, but when it comes to water, which is again 70% of our planet's surface, our topography, our resolution, the amount of detail we have, one to four kilometers, is, is much, much less than even the moon or Mars. And we have no pictures of the seafloor like we do of the entire planet uh, surface or moon surface. So this is the challenge um, that we face. But like I said, there's still plenty of information here. So I'll just talk a little bit about some of the features that we do see at this one to four kilometer resolution. Um, this line here, we're gonna take a slice through the planet here, which looks like this. So this represents a slice through the Southern Pacific Ocean. So we have South America over here, and we have probably the kingdom of Tonga, sits right there, represented by these islands here. We see this mountain chain right here. This is called the East Pacific Rise. This is a mid-ocean ridge. And it's represented here like that. And mid-ocean ridges are where new ocean crust is being formed by volcanic processes. So this is really a huge string of volcanoes and the most famous one, of course, is the Mid-Atlantic Ridge here. And the Atlantic Ocean is growing wider and wider and wider over time. North and South America used to be attached to Africa and Europe. And about 150 million years ago, they started pulling apart from each other. And this is the zipper, if you will. And they're moving apart at about two centimeters per year. So that's what that is right there. This is another one, the East Pacific Rise. We have uh, French Polynesia over here, getting what we call hot spots, which are sites where there is constant volcanic activity. Hawaii is a classic example of that in the middle of the ocean. Then over here, we have a process which we call subduction. And subduction is the opposite of what happens at a mid ocean ridge. A mid ocean ridge is where we are creating new oceanic seafloor, subduction is where we're actually destroying it. This entire continent, uh, oceanic tectonic plate actually dives down underneath another one. This is where we get our really deep trenches, and it's usually associated again with volcanic activity, the formation of islands. And you see this process on the uh, Western Pacific Rim, these are a whole bunch of volcanic chains, and you can see there's the Marianas Trench, the deepest part of the ocean right there. Um, these events are all occurring as a result of this subduction process. And so with this map and these data that we derived from satellites again, we're able to now see all of these major geological features on the seafloor. But what if we want to get more detail? Again, this is one to four kilometers. You're not, you, know, you can't really see anything. You definitely cannot see anything smaller than a kilometer on the seafloor using this information. So how do we get better information on the seafloor? If we go back to Google Earth, here we are in the Pacific Ocean. There is New Zealand, there is Fiji, there's Tahiti right there. Now, if you look at this image, you can see all these stripes on the seafloor. And I made the mistake once of, of Googling stripes on the seafloor. And it took me to a whole bunch of YouTube videos of conspiracy theorists who say that these are results of secret aliens that live on the seafloor. Um, yeah. If you notice, a lot of these lines are all radiating from Tahiti. 
and it could be because aliens like going to Tahiti. Um, but what these actually are, we're going to zoom in to the square right here. So we zoomed right in. You can see here are those same lines. And what you can see is they're actually parts of the seafloor that are much more detailed than you see over here. So this all looks kind of blurry, and then you see quite detailed information here. The blurry image is that satellite one to four kilometer resolution that I was talking about. And this is much higher resolution. And these, what these lines represent are ship tracks. These are where ships have been driving, special ships, hydrographic or research vessels that can map the seafloor using sonar. So you send a, a sound wave down to the seafloor, measuring the time it takes for that sound pane to travel back to the ship, you can then calculate depth. And so a lot of ships now are equipped with what we call multi-beam sonar systems, multi-beam echo sounders, there's many different words for it. And so in this case, there was a ship traveling and it was mapping the seafloor as the ship was traveling either to or from Tahiti. The width of this, just to give you a sense of scale, is probably somewhere around eight kilometers or, or so. So to give you a sense of how much of this higher resolution and how high resolution is this. Again, this is one to four kilometers is the amount of information we have here. Today, we can get information maybe 30 or 40 meters in terms of uh, the resolution. Resolution is affected by how deep we are, but in the open ocean, right around four kilometers or so, 30, 50 meter resolution here. So right away, we can see how useful this is um, to get much, much higher uh, resolution data, much more information about what the seafloor looks like. And so you can see there's been plenty of ship traps going in all sorts of different directions. Here's a map showing how much of the seafloor has been mapped using this technique, using ships with sonar systems. Again, this represents only publicly available data, but you can see that um, um, here's Hawaii. A lot of people seem to like to go to Hawaii. You can see that there are large patches that have been mapped out quite well. Um, again, this is uh, the East Pacific Rise, the Mid Ocean Ridge here. Uh, here's the Mid Atlantic Ridge, and you can see there's been a lot of research on these ridges, which is why there's been a lot of mapping there. It looks like there's a drunk captain over there. Um, the problem is, is that this is great. You get a, hot, a lot of really good information from this. We have only been able to map about 5% of the seafloor using this method so far. So we have a long ways to go. Again, the resolution around 30, 50 meters seems to get better and better every year. Um, there's just another example. This is taken from right here on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge where we have the very blurry satellite data and then the much more detailed um, mapping from, again, from a research or hydrographic vessel. Okay, now what if we want to see even smaller features than what can be seen with 30, 40 meter resolution bathymetry? What if we want to see something on the order of a meter, two meters? Um, an example, is um, aircraft, there's the, uh, the Air Malaysia uh, airplane that crashed and they're looking for it in the Indian Ocean. You know, that wreckage is on the order of maybe a few meters, tens of meters across. With this sort of technology, you'd probably not see that at all. Um, from my own perspective, I want to see things like black smokers. Again, this is another example of what was on that first slide I showed you. I'll explain what these are um, using this diagram down here. What's coming out of these chimneys is seawater. Seawater that has infiltrated into the seafloor, into the rock. And again, along these mid-ocean ridges, these are long volcanic chains. So there's a lot of heat in the subsurface. There's magma, and this heats up all this water that sinks into the crust. And then as it heats it up, it becomes very reactive. And the water reacts 
with all the rock down here. And in these rocks, there's a lot of metals. Metals like copper and gold and zinc, metals that are quite valuable to us as society. And these fluids get hot and then become buoyant and they go back up, shoot up towards the sea, uh, sea floor. And when they hit the sea floor, they mix with cold seawater and all these minerals end up accumulating right on the seafloor at these sites. So that's what you're seeing here. These are all metal rich, we call them massive sulfide deposits, we call them black smokers, there's a number of uh, hydrothermal vents, different names for these. This black smoke you see here are actually, the smoke is very tiny particles, minerals that are precipitating right out of this fluid. And so some of the minerals go up as smoke and some of them form these large structures on the seafloor. And again, these structures are very rich in metals such as copper and gold, rich to the point where some companies and some countries are thinking of actually trying to mine these off the seafloor. Um, for those of you who are interested, when the talk is over on that table over there, I have uh, a piece of one of these chimneys and we'll turn the lights on and, and you can take a look at it. Okay, but you wouldn't be able to find something like this with this size using this type of mapping because it's too coarse. There's not enough detail here. So we have to go even higher detail. To do that, we need to get closer to the seafloor. And the way we do that is using relatively newer technology called autonomous underwater vehicles or AUVs. You can think of these as drones, underwater drones. And again, the same sort of mapping system, multi-beam bathymetry, that you can map the seafloor, but because these vehicles can fly much closer to the seafloor, you get much higher resolution data um, to the point where you can get meter or sub-meter resolution instead of 20 or 40 uh, meters. So what does that look like? Well, here's an area of the seafloor. We're kind of looking at it from an angle. Um, there's a, a valley here along this mountain range. And this is 50 meter resolution from one of these research vessels. So we drove over it and mapped the seafloor. This is what it looks like if an AUV had flown over it, at maybe between 50 and 100 meters above the seafloor and mapped it. And we get one meter resolution. So 50 meter to one meter you can see how much more information. Here's another example. We're now right in that valley, and this is 50 meter resolution again. And that's what it looks like at one meter resolution. So 50 meters, one meter. All of these structures you see here are hydrothermal vents. 20 to 30 meters high, 20 to 30 meters across. Here, this is all we really see. You would never know that this is actually this. So resolution and how detailed your maps are become very important if you want to find things of a certain size on the seafloor. Once you find something like that on the map, you then go and you want to take samples of it or you want to take photographs or video images of it. How do you do that? Well, these are um, manned submersibles. This is Elvin, which belongs to um, the United States. And um, this can dive down to about 6,000 meters. So there's a few of these. Um, the French have one, the Nautil, the Japanese and the Chinese each have one. Um, the Russians and the Germans also have these deep sea research submersibles. As you can see, you can cram three people in them. Um, there's three little windows you can look out, and these are robotic arms that you could use to put down um, research equipment or pick up samples from the seafloor. More commonly nowadays, we use uh, remotely operated vehicles, ROVs. These are controlled from a control room on the ship, which is much more comfortable than being crammed into a 
steer for eight hours. Um, so you control it from a ship. And, but otherwise, it's, it's about the same. There are robotic arms, there are lights and cameras, so you can pick up samples, you can take videos or, or, or uh, still images of the seafloor. And this is how we would collect something like that rock we see over there. The amount of research that's been done so far on these black smokers on the seafloor. Um, We've now discovered just over 300 of these, and you can see how they are very clearly um, linked to these mid-ocean ridges, mountain ranges, and then again, these subduction zones in the Pacific. And every year we find more, every year the technology improves, and um, we're able to get higher resolution maps of the seafloor and find more of these on these sites. The challenge is why don't we just go around the seafloor with these AUVs and just map everything at this really high resolution. Here's why we don't do that. Here we are in the Atlantic Ocean. This is South America, there's Africa, and um, the eastern tip of North America. I was on a research cruise on this ship, this is a German research vessel, the Meteor, last summer for six weeks. We started in Barbados, and our research area was right here, this box on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. So right where the, the two sides are pulling away from each other, and there's a, a, a train of volcanoes. And the cruise ended in the Azores, these islands right here. Now it takes just under a week to get from here to here, and just under a week to get from here to here. So for a six week research cruise, we're now down to four weeks that we could spend actually doing our work in this box. In that time, this is the amount of seafloor that we mapped with our research vessel. So it gives you a sense of scale as to how long it would take if we wanted to map the entire uh, surface of the ocean, uh, uh, of the seafloor, using this method. It was four weeks in this little box, six weeks total to get a map like that. And we're going to zoom in on this box. We also had an AUV with us. Again, here's the map generated with the ship. So this is a 20 meter resolution. That right there is the amount of sea floor we were able to map in that four week period using our autonomous underwater vehicle. It was a total of 10 dives to map that little postage stamp within this area um, on the sea floor. So the amount of time it takes and the amount of the expense for doing something like this is um, uh, prohibited at this point if we wanted to cover the entire sea floor at even this resolution, this is one meter resolution, but this resolution would then compare to what we know of Mars or the moon. It would take decades and billions of dollars to do that. Again, one of the other big motivations for studying these sites on the seafloor is that a hydrothermal vent is an oasis for very unique life forms. These are tube worms. These are life forms that are known only to exist at hydrothermal vents on the seafloor. They are unique because this is one of the few ecosystems we know of, the first ever discovered, that doesn't rely on sunlight for energy. Us, plants, animals on Earth, ultimately our energy comes from the sun. In this case, the energy comes from these organisms feeding off of chemicals in these fluids. You can see the shimmering water, this is warm water coming up. And it's a, a there's bacteria that live in these tube worms, and they actually feed off of H2S, which is incredibly toxic to people like us. But this forms the basis of an ecosystem, and then other animals will then feed off of the tube worms, and you have an entire functioning environment that the food ultimately comes from 
these banks. Some people think this is actually where life may have started on Earth. We know very little about these um, types of ecosystems, and so a big push in trying to discover these systems and study them is, is understanding a part of life on our own planet that, that we know very little about. At the same time, there's a push Again, in society, we, requ we uh, require resources, and here's the potential um, source for these resources. Here's an article from Scientific American, C4 miners poised to cut into an invisible frontier. Uh, the Economist plucking minerals from the seabed is back on the agenda. The New York Times, the gold rush in the abyss. So there's a push to start mining the sea floor. Something like this has never been done before. Um, Nautilus Minerals is uh, one of the companies that is uh, most advanced in this industry. These are the instruments, these are the tools, the vehicles they've built to actually mine these systems off of the seafloor. And they've made a nice little animation to uh, show how this would work. They have a support vessel which just sits on the sea surface above these. Uh, these sites. They lower their instruments down to the ground. You have cutters that will cut up the rock. Again, these are all robotic vehicles, so they're controlled from the surface. You cut up the rock. You then have to um, grind the rock into smaller and smaller pieces. This is the instrument that would do that. And then ultimately, you have to suck this material back up to the ship. And to do that, they use what is called a riser system simply pumps and pipes and you form a, a, a slurry, a mixture of the ore material, the broken up rock and water and you pump it back to the ship. On the ship you dewater the ore, you get rid of all the water, you collect the remaining material, the water gets sent back down to the bottom and then you offload your ore onto a barge and then send that away to smelter where it will turn into gold or copper, um, zinc, lead, silver, um, that then goes to the market and is used for construction, or jewelry, or, or, or whatever it is. We go back to images like this and it, it, it shows us the challenges that we have ahead of us. If we want to mine the seafloor, we need to understand the seafloor. Um, this is the state of the art we're at right now in terms of understanding and knowing what is on our seafloor and being able to get better and better resolution images of the seafloor and we have to deal with challenges like this. On a six-week cruise we're able to only map a small little percentage of the seafloor. As you can see this is just the northern Atlantic. It's a big ocean. And there's a lot of it. And, um, and so these are the challenges that we face. And especially in, a, in an age where resources are so valuable and mining on land is controversial, where do we get our resources? Um, mining on the seafloor, for sure, that's going to be controversial. What are the environmental impacts of doing this? What are the regulatory, who owns the seafloor in different places? These are a lot of challenges that we face. Um, one of the other um, examples is, well, we just take our mining elsewhere. Um, these are artistic renderings of mining the moon, mining the asteroids, and we think this is sort of all in the future science fiction, but it's not. There are companies that are actively looking of ways of doing this and starting to think about the technology that would be required. Um, to actually do this. And, and for myself, as a, um, someone who I consider myself an explorer, I spend a lot of my time when I'm out on ships, which is looking at the seafloor and seeing what we find down there. And, uh, and it's that sort of drive that has driven me to, um, to pursue this line of work. And uh, last year, Canada put out a call for some new astronauts. So I applied. And um, there's a terrible photo of me on the Canadian Space Agency website. I was shortlisted. Um, they're hiring two astronauts, 
and about 3,800 people applied. So there's a lot of people who applied. I made it to the short list of, of 72 people um, left, and I, I'm, I'm no longer in the running. I've, I've, I've since been uh, cut out. There are only 17 people left. Um, but a lot of people ask me, you know, in terms of career path and, and, and what got me to the point where I'd even be considered for something like this. And really, my answer is, is my, my sense of exploration. And especially for, for young people who are trying to decide what they want to do with their lives, um, my advice is, um, you, know, I, you know, I want to be an astronaut. How do I want to be an astronaut? There's no clear path to becoming an astronaut. Um, the other people who I met in this process, people did all sorts of things. There are many different types of doctors. There are a lot of scientists. Um, there are a lot of, uh, of military, uh, military doctors and a lot of military pilots. Um, so generally, you have to be one of those things, a scientist, a pilot, or a doctor. And some of the people were actually all three. Um, but really what everyone had in common was um, a sense of curiosity. And I never thought that me becoming a geologist would lead me down this path. Um, but what helped me was, was my sense of curiosity. And if I go back to one of my very first slides, and I noticed when I, I, I put this talk together and I look at you know, all the different places where I got my education and the different places I've worked, um, all of this was, was driven by curiosity. And, and whether you're interested in, in math or biology or chemistry, no matter what it is, um, ultimately, if you're interested in, in, in something you're curious about, then it'll take you down these paths where, where, where you can do all sorts of things in all sorts of different places and all sorts of different people. And the one thing that everyone in, in the, the astronaut recruitment program had, um, a thing in common was that no one stayed home. Everyone just went out and saw as much of the world as, as possible. And I think that made a big difference. So the young people in the audience, don't stay home. As soon as mom and dad let you leave the house, just go and just keep going and see as many places as you can and, uh, and that'll make a big difference. And uh, I'm going to end there. I'll be happy to take any questions that anybody has. So thank you. So if you'd like, I can give you a microphone so people can hear you okay. Uh, if, uh, like, do you see so you study subduction zones, right? Yes. Uh, well, uh, if uh, you know how the magnetic field uh, can change, well, well, if the magnetic field wants to change quickly, what uh, would happen? So that's a that's a very interesting question. Um, the magnetic field changing is what actually led us to understand plate tectonics. So what I showed you, all these ridges here, the fact that the plates are moving apart and colliding, um, all of that was what really solidified, and this is a, a new plate tectonics, this understanding of how oceans open and close only came about in the 60s, 70s, so it's, it's from a scientific point of view, that's very young. Um, but what happened was they saw there's these magnetic stripes on either side of a ridge. And what they concluded is that the stripes would change polarity, so like the magnets in the rocks would switch. And there'd be this regular switching on either side. And they realize is that the rocks will record the orientation of the magnetic field when the rocks form. So right now, north is up, south is down, right? So rocks that form today 
all the little magnets in the rock, north points north, south points down. Um, but there are these stripes, these patterns, where it was the opposite. And that was recording the fact that the pole changes every once in a while. Every million, sort of the million year scale, it'll change. And so it was that understanding that really helped um, us understand how these plates are moving. And then the question a lot of people have is, okay, so we could see that that is recorded in the rocks. We could see where the magnetic poles switch. What happens to birds, for example? Birds migrate because they have little compasses in their heads. Um, people have looked into whether or not you get extinction. So a lot of animals dying because they get confused and they don't know which direction they go. And they're heading to cold weather when they should be heading to hot weather. Um, I don't know, my understanding is there's not much evidence of that. And so really, no one seems to mind a whole lot if the poles suddenly change direction. Um, I don't know how birds figure it out. Maybe they just realize that it's getting colder and they want to get warmer, so they just change direction. Maybe, I don't know. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah. Okay. 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 Uh, oh, sorry, if you have another one, go ahead. Also, you know how, you know the picture of the stripes on the, the screen? The, the ones where you're saying uh, that Googled. Uh, oh, yes. Google yeah. I'll go back to those. Much simpler way. Did I? There we go. Well, to be honest, it kind of does look like aliens to us. <laughs> Looks like an underground highway. Well, you know, it's if you didn't know where those lines came from, it's not a bad assumption to make that there's something on the seafloor leaving these big marks, these big trails. Um, because we know exactly why they're there. Um, the people with the conspiracy theories. Yes, <laughs> but I mean they're the same people who think no one's walked on the moon yet, and the Earth is actually flat. And I think they're just people who are bored. Um, we also look at the Martian canals. Right. Yeah, the Martian canals is, is that, that's an excellent analogy. Is the surface of Mars back before we had these super high resolution maps? Um, but yes, I agree. They, they definitely look funny. And if, you know, the fact that people looked and noticed and questioned, why are those lines there? I think is a good start. Saying it's aliens is just a bit lazy. What do I say? I say those are passages from your <laughs> Well, what you need to do is make a YouTube video. You will get millions of people who will watch it. Guarantee it. Does anybody else have any questions? Go ahead, ahead. Pass it in after. Are you looking at like any other planet surfaces other than Mars? Um, me personally, no. But there are um, a lot of people who are looking at um, the 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 most interesting right now are the moons of Saturn and Jupiter. And the reason those are interesting is because some of the moons have very interesting atmospheres that I think may support life or oceans. And actually there's a, a news release, I think just last week, about one of Jupiter's moons that is um, it's covered in ice, but they, they're pretty sure that there's liquid water beneath the ice. So kind of like the North Pole right now. Um, but they detected methane coming into the atmosphere. And methane is a chemical that is, um, it can be related to 
black smokers and, and reactions and heat in the subsurface. And the fact that we think that life on Earth may have started at a black smoker, and then we see what looks to be a very similar environment on one of Jupiter's moons, that's very exciting. And so people really want to go there and they want to dig through the ice and go into the water and probably take an AUV, one of these underwater drones. People are, are, are coming up with ways of doing that. So there is a, a lot of interest by a lot of people in you know, the planets and, and especially the moons of, of Jupiter and Saturn, which have all these really um, interesting characteristics that we see on Earth sometimes and we don't see on Earth in some cases, and trying to understand what those are is, is really interesting. There is plenty, plenty of work to be done in the future still exploring our own solar system. The space program will be busy for years and years and years. And the thing about the space program is it's not just astronauts or people who design rockets. There's chemists and biologists and artists. There's everyone is involved in these in, in these programs. And so there's there's gonna be uh, so much opportunity in the future for scientists to study these things. Back here on Earth, uh, in the area around Newfoundland and in Labrador, are there opportunities, mapping opportunities that are presenting themselves because of industrial activity, oil and gas exploration? So, I'm like, does Newfoundland, the area around Newfoundland, present some unique opportunities? Uh, definitely. Um, of course, the oil and gas industry is is a big one. Understanding the properties of the seafloor is really important for um, where you put your oil platforms, where you lay your cables, and your pipelines, um, things like slope stability, because you don't want a landslide where you have um, you know, a pipeline or something like that. Uh, it's important from a fisheries perspective, understanding habitats on the seafloor. Um, so yes, the short answer is there is um, plenty of opportunity, plenty of activity. Um, and in fact, Memorial University Marine Institute, there's a lot of active research being done here, especially on the technology side, with how, again, how, how can we do this better? How can we get better resolution maps, um, higher quality data, do it cheaper, do it faster? Um, yeah, it's, it's definitely a big, big thing around here. Does anybody else have any questions? Um, I guess my question would be um, based on the uh, mechanics of subsea mapping. Like what is done to uh, mitigate the environmental uh, effects on animals? Because uh, I know from my experience in the Navy, you know, uh, with sonar, you can hear it pinging off vessels. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I know that it affects whales and migratory patterns and that type of thing. And, the surface mapping must be very intrusive as opposed to the subsurface, the uh, AOB, because there's much closer, you know, below most of the uh, sea like there were yeah. used to. So most research vessels, um, depending on the work that's being done, will have um, mammal watchers. So people on watch who are on the lookout for mammals. This is especially true for seismic surveys. Um, seismic surveys are used for, for not just the, the sea floor, but what's beneath the sea floor. So they often use um, sort of air guns underwater and explosives. And so those are you know, much louder. And uh, generally, if, you, if there's any mammals in the area, you have to cease op uh, operations for that. Um, other than that, that's um, in terms of just multi beam mapping from the ship, I don't know of, I'm not familiar enough to know what regulations are in place with regards to that. I know that the, um, there's a lot of debate as to what effects this has on mammals. Some people say, well, actually, there's no evidence it has any effect. And other people say, well, actually, it does because of this, that, the other. I'm not, I'm not totally familiar with that. That literature. Um, 
but I do know that people are conscious that it may have an effect. And again, if there are, you know, you cite whales, that sort of thing, you generally stop the gender until you don't. Uh, Here's a comment that ties into the um, uh, sub mind too, because uh, once you get off land, it's basically uh, a free fall. Uh, it becomes regulatory. Right. So the the regulatory free for all is is people are trying to change that. So countries have jurisdiction over um, their called exclusive economic zone, which is up to. Uh, 250 nautical miles of it, um, from your shoreline, and then that's your considered your seafloor. You can do what you want with the regulations of your country. Um, for seafloor mining, there's actually a, a United Nations body, the International Seabed Authority, which regulates that, and, and so they have regulations in place, um, you know, environmental practices. It's a work in progress, but at the end of the day. There will be a regulatory framework so that it is not a free for all. And that includes um, environmental monitoring and, and reporting and, and uh, paying royalties. And so it turns into a huge legal document, of course. So. Okay, does anybody else have any questions? Oh, we've got some over here. Uh, I was just curious, actually, regarding the maritime link, if there was any uh, mapping or topography that had to be built on the ocean floor when they were uh, getting ready to start laying the line. For? For the maritime link with the hydroelectric cable. Oh, um, I don't know in that specific case, but I think in, in pretty much any time people are going to be laying cables like that, they, they do mapping at first. Um, these days, a lot of it's being done with AUVs and um, depending on how far back you go with ships, whatever that was, um, whatever technology was available at the time. Um, again, things like landslides and, and you know, really jagged edges where the cable would be exposed in the water column, and you have to be worried uh, worrying about um, you know, bottom trawling in terms of fisheries. And, and so yeah, there's a lot of things to to consider, but mapping is always step one and just understand what the C4 actually looks like. Sure. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. John, I was wondering why, or was there a reason why you chose where you met last summer? And in general, is there a reason for, yeah, a lot of reasons why places get met where they do get met? Are there any other reasons? Yeah, the, what we do is we, you know, the, the purpose of that cruise was to study some black smokers um, in that area. And we use with that ridge, the Mid Atlantic Ridge, had been mapped already in the past. So we had, I think, about 100 meter resolution maps. And one of the things we're doing is, is we're looking for ways of how we can interpret the features we see on the seafloor at that scale to predict where we would find black smokers. So there's, there's certain geological criteria that are favorable for black smokers. And then when we identify those areas, we say, okay, this place looks interesting. Let's go there. And then we mapped it with the ship at, at about 30 meter resolution. And, and then from there, so now we have even better resolution. We identify targets. We then send AUV now to map those at one meter, and then so you, you sort of work your way towards the point where you can go down with a submersible or remotely operated vehicle and know, okay, that's exactly where we want to go. So you start broad, and then with the data available, you work your way to a target. Okay, does anybody else have any questions for John?
Oh, we have one more on here. I guess. Is this about aliens again? <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay. I, I uh, just thought of this one actually. Um, do you know of the uh, under underground ocean in the Earth's maple? Yes. Uh, would there be possible? Would it be possible for for there to be? Uh, Black members in that show would have just be super volcanoes and that kind of stuff. Yeah, the, the people who called it the, the underground ocean did every, did, it was a disservice to everybody because what we picture is that there's a big ocean underwater and what they should have said is that, this, so for, for everyone else, there's a study that came out a year or two ago, and it, it was, they measured, and it's not liquid water, like we think of in the ocean, it's not even pore water, like we think of in, in aquifers, in sand aquifers, or groundwater, that sort of thing. It's actually locked into the crystal structure of the rock. And what this research group did is they, they said, well, based on how much of this water is locked up in the rocks or the subsurface, it's, it's a huge, it's a huge amount. And they said, it's like there's an ocean underground. And then what happened is, is that in everyone's minds, they think if there's an ocean underground, it, journey to the center of the earth. That's exactly, have you read Journey to the Center of the Earth? Yeah, I've seen the game, the second one. I don't know the second one. Oh, I don't know the second one. So, yes, um, to get back to your question, no, we would not see these features um, deep underground simply because the water is locked up in the rock. And if it's moving, it's moving at the scale of millimeters per year or something like that, just within the rock. So, unfortunately not. Uh, I was really hoping there would actually be. I'm sorry. <laughs> you were hoping there were aliens too. <laughs> I'm, I'm just, just, just giving you bad news, aren't I? Uh, although, I guess it wouldn't even be possible because uh, the weight of the gravity because of the Earth's own top of the water. It would be pulled into the Earth's core, so the water would be, be uh, forced to its side anyways, really. I don't know the answer to that. The water, the, the pressures down there are extremely high. Uh, you're definitely right. Um, whether or not that forces the water in a certain direction or not, I, I don't know. The water seems to be quite happy where it is right now. So. Anybody else have any questions? Oh, we have one more over here again. Dan's getting his money's worth tonight. Is it possible for the Earth to flood? Is it possible for the Earth to flood? Um, I don't think it is. It is possible for um, Ottawa and Winnipeg and whatever other cities are flooding right now because of the spring melt. Um, but for the Earth in general, um, no. Uh, simply because the water would have to come from somewhere. And um, right now, unless, I'm trying to think of how the Earth, the Earth could flood if a comet, so a lot of comets are made up mostly of water. If a comet that was big enough hit the Earth and didn't destroy it, it would add a lot of water to the surface. Um, and um, and that's the only scenario I can think of. Um, sea level is going up because uh, uh, ice caps uh, and glaciers are melting, um, but there's not enough water to, to flood the planet, though, though there's still, there'll still be plenty of land. So um, probably not. Comets are actually uh, mostly ice, actually, that are on fire. They're on fire? 
Well, can get too close to stood some eat, well, not on fire, but Comet King can, can get too close to the, to a, a sun, say, and the, but you, you had the comet that would be serene, say, and eventually it will look eons, it will whittle down to the size of this table. Sure, it's yes, a, they're, they're always losing material, that big trail behind them is picks of the comet. Blown away by the sun. Do we have any more questions? We may have exhausted the room finally. <laughs> All right. Well, I would like to say thank you to John for coming out and educating us tonight about how aliens landed on Earth and put tracks <laughs> on the ocean floor. So thank you very much, John. Thank you. <laughs> and please um, take a, a look at the rock on, on your way out. Um, I appreciate it. I, People would not touch it because it's actually quite um, fragile. But uh, we'll turn the lights up, and you're, you're, you can get your your nose and your eyes as close to it as as you want, and take a look. Oh, yeah.